and uh, so we will have Bob Sherman, our, the candidate of the Green Party, uh, for representative to Congress from the fifth CD of uh, Illinois. Uh, from the Green Party. Our speaker, Rob Sherman. Yay. Thank you. I want to turn that off. I want to turn that off. You don't need it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rob Sherman. I'm a candidate for the nomination of the Green Party for Congress in the 5th Congressional District. The incumbent is Mike Quigley. That's the district we're talking about, and it's on the north and northwest sides of Chicago, and actually more than half of the district is in the suburbs. It's the near northwest suburbs, near west suburbs, uh, uh, and uh, uh, mostly in Cook County, and a little bit on the eastern edge of DuPage County. First thing that I'll talk about are my top three agenda items uh, top three items on my campaign platform uh, that are relevant to the people of the 5th Congressional District. Issue number one, a lot of people are concerned about noise from O'Hare Airport that uh, with the new parallel runways uh, that uh, there's a lot of jet noise in areas that had not previously had noise. Uh, a friend of mine by the name of Jacques, uh, Jacques Charlier, Jack Charlier, however you want to pronounce it, uh, he had put together an organization called FAIR, F-A-I-R, FAIR Allocation and Runways, which would uh, uh, keep the four diagonal runways in addition to the six parallel runways. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a pilot. Celeste and I have an airplane. We, we have an orange airplane. Here's what, the, uh, here's what the airplane looks like with Celeste and me in the airplane. Okay. It's a two-seater, and we can fly all over the country in this airplane. Uh, I've flown down as far as uh, uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, we fly to Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, all over the country. So as a pilot, I'm familiar with what works and what doesn't work as a pilot uh, for airplanes. And keeping the diagonal runways doesn't make one iota of difference because as soon as you lift off from the runway, before you're even at the perimeter of the airport, air traffic control will tell you to turn on course. That means you turn to the course that you're flying, and with the big jets, they are required to fly over very specific routes, specific waypoints, specific intersections, at specific altitudes. And they turn on course before they even leave the perimeter of the airport. So the runways are kind of like driveways. It's kind of like the driveway out of this parking lot. If you're concerned about too much traffic on the Kennedy Expressway, it doesn't do any good to change the direction of the driveway out of this shopping mall. It still you know, it won't affect one thing in regards to the expressway. So the solution for the people of the 5th Congressional District we need new sets of waypoints, new intersections that the planes will fly over. And with GPS, you can establish a whole variety of routes. That way, on, uh, for one week, you'll be flying over one set of routes. Uh, next week, you use a different route. Next week, a different route. And so you can vary the routes instead of having the planes go over the same route, hour after hour, day after day, forever. That's the solution in regards to noise, jet noise from O'Hare Airport. That's issue number one. Issue number two, 
The revenue scam cameras, the red light cameras, they're not for safety, they're for generating revenue. And one of the tricks, one of the dirty tricks that Rom has come up with is to shorten the yellow lights. People will say, well, you know, you don't want a ticket for running a red light at a red light camera, make sure you stop before the light turns red. But when Ron shortens the yellow light, it's a scam. It's red light camera fraud. Because everywhere else in the country, a, a yellow light is a standard length. Ladies and gentlemen, little known fact about Rob Sherman. I used to do traffic signal timing sequences yeah. when I worked for the City of Chicago, Department of Public Works, Bureau of Traffic Engineering and Operations. That was my job to write the traffic signal timing sequences. And the standard was, for the timing sequences, the standard for the yellow light is one second for every 10 miles an hour plus a half a second for your reaction time when you see the light turn yellow. So if the speed limit is 30, the yellow light shall be three and a half seconds. If the speed limit is 35, the yellow light needs to be four seconds. And people have been driving long enough, they know how long that is. Well, if you're expecting a four second yellow light going through and all of a sudden the light turns red and you're just about to approach the intersection, what happened? What happened with the short yellow light? What's with the short yellow light? So I'm, I have several proposals to deal with revenue scam cameras. Number one, number one, I will sponsor federal legislation to ban these revenue scam, these revenue scam cameras. No more red light cameras anywhere in the country. And when that proposal is rejected, I've got a backup proposal. Because, you know, you want to give them something to say no to, so that they'll say yes to your second proposal. So the second proposal will be a combination of things. We know living in Chicago that there are a lot of low bridges, low viaducts. And where you have one that's below the minimum of 13 feet 6 inches, even below the standard height of 14 feet 6 inches, if it's lower than 14 feet 6 inches, there's a sign that says low clearance 13 feet 2 inches, low clearance 12 inches, 6, 12 feet 6 inches. I want to, I will sponsor a law that will require the posting of short yellow signs at intersections where the yellow light duration is shorter than the standard length of time. All right. So it'll say short yellow, 3.0 seconds. Or short yellow, 2.9 seconds. Short right. yellow, 3.5 seconds if, if the speed limit is uh, higher than 30. If its speed limit is 40 and ROM shortens the yellow, to trick you <coughs> into running the red. That's one half of the proposal. The other half of the proposal, you'll also, I think you'll also like. I propose, I will sponsor legislation to, and we'll see which of these pieces of legislation can get adopted. I will sponsor legislation to require a bright red line across the lanes of traffic at a point before the intersection which designates if you cross this line when you're going the speed limit, you will make it into and through the, the intersection before the light turns red. And if you haven't crossed this line when the light turns yellow, you need to stop because you won't make it to the intersection before the light turns red. So I'm proposing that you have this Sherman line, the bright red line, across all lanes of traffic at every <coughs> intersection that has a red light camera and there are a lot of them so that way you'll know okay I'm going the speed limit and I'm in front of the line I'm gonna make it through or I'm going the speed limit I haven't made it to that line I need to stop 
So that way you, you'll know whether, and, and, and you, know, you won't have an excuse then as to why did you, know, why did you get that red light camera ticket? Why did you get that revenue scam camera oh, ticket? God. You've got that line, you haven't made it to that line when the light turns yellow, you better stop. So that's my second proposal. First, dealing with O'Hare, and second, dealing with the revenue scam cameras. The third proposal that's specifically relevant to the 5th Congressional District. According to the federal government, the Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Services, we don't have a law in this country to ban bullying. There is no law against bullying. I will sponsor legislation to make bullying a federal offense. <laughs> now, the first, you know, on the first offense, maybe it's a warning. Gosh, I, I didn't know it was bullying. When, when I, I told that young lady in the, uh, in the gray sweater over there, gosh, you're the most gorgeous woman I've ever seen in all 63 years of my life. Or, oh no, bull bullying is, a, is well, you, you know, she might regard that as sexual harassment, okay? All right, sexual harassment, bullying, okay. I didn't know that something like that would offend her. Uh, there are a lot of, the reason this is relevant to the people of the 5th Congressional District, there are a lot of people in the district along places like Halstead Street who might be subject to bullying about their sexual preference or sexual orientation. And, you know, they, they have a right to their dignity. They have a right to be left alone and not picked on. So I would sponsor federal, federal legislation to make bullying a federal offense. Now, it's only illegal if somebody complains. It's only illegal if it's enforced. But it certainly might go towards deterring and uh, 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 reducing the frequency of this kind of conduct. That would be a good thing. So those are my top three issues for the 5th District. I have a number of other issues on my campaign agenda, but one in particular is particularly is, uh, specifically relevant to the College of Complexes. Yes. Yes. Right. How many of you were here a month or two ago when some guy named Charlie talked about a proposal for new federal holidays? You remember that when Charlie talked? Yeah. Who remembers when Charlie talked about new federal holidays? I'm trying to forget about it. Okay. I have a list of new federal holidays. Celeste, don't lose my seat there. Welcome, come on in. All right, so here's my list of new federal holidays. Have a seat, and I, I hope you like my list. First item on my list, we would keep, and, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, since there are 10 federal holidays, labor would be very upset if we reduce the number of holidays below 10. Management, of course, would be just as upset if we increase the number of holidays above 10. So I have a list of 10 federal holidays. This is my list. And keep in mind, this is the beginning of a discussion. These are talking points. It's something to consider. You keep one, get rid of a different one. Here's my proposal for 10 federal holidays. Holiday number one, we would keep New Year's Day because everybody likes New Year's Day. I'm, I'm looking for holidays that continue to be relevant that people observe. There are some holidays that, you know, it, it's relevant to a, a small group or to a limited group, but for most of us, uh, it's just, you know, just another day. It's no big deal, and, and it's ignored. So most people commemorate New Year's Day. We'll keep that as the first holiday. First holiday will be New Year's Day. Second holiday, where's Charlie? This one's there. There he is. There he is. All right, we're going to skip the second holiday because this one is something that Charlie 
would like. So I'll wait for him to come up. Oh, there, there you are. are. I'm listening. All right. Here's the second holiday. Second holiday is on February. It, it would be February 14th. It would be a combination of Valentine's Day, because everybody <laughs> loves somebody, and also <laughs> National Railroad Appreciation oh, no. Day. Oh, wow. Have I got your vote, Charlie? Oh, it's, 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 oh, so instead of voting lovely. For, lovely. for Bernie, uh, yeah. you want to vote for me because Bernie isn't sponsoring National Railroad Appreciation <laughs> Day. Okay, I will sponsor legislation to make February 14th both Valentine's Day because everybody loves somebody and needs somebody to love and combined with National Railroad Appreciation Day. Are you with me, Charlie? Oh, Can we get rid of the expensive part, buying stuff for the, the girls? Hey, you get her a model train set, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the third holiday. And, and by the way, with these holidays, I have no more than one holiday. Hi, I'm Rob Sherman. I'm running for Congress, and this is my campaign agenda. Uh, running for Congress in the, in, in the 5th Congressional District. That, that's right around here. So here's the third holiday, and, and there's, there's no more than one holiday per month, so we have to spread out. The first Monday in April would be a holiday. It would be baseball opening day and, because, you know, opening day at Ridley Field. That ought to be a holiday, ladies and gentlemen. It ought to be a holiday all across the country. The first you know, opening day at Wrigley Field and opening yeah. day at, at the various places, at various stadiums, baseball stadiums, because, ladies and gentlemen, we're not Canada, we're not England. Our sport is baseball. Some of you like other sports too. Cricket. What about but, cricket? Uh, what's that? Cricket. Well, that's why I say we're not England, we're not Canada, so we'll make opening day and Rob Sherman's birthday, April 2nd. That's combined on the first Monday of April. That will be a federal holiday. I'm sponsoring a federal holiday to make April 2nd and the opening day as a uh, uh, federal holiday. But that takes the fun out of calling in sick for opening day. That, that's right. Now, you shouldn't have to do that. And, and Celeste, you got more people coming in, so make sure you don't give away my seat there or my soup. All right. Next holiday. So we have the first Monday in April. Let's make the first Monday in May Mother's Day. We, well, most of us have a mother. I, I don't remember if Charlie had one, but uh, most of us had a mother or have a mother, so we would make the first Monday in May Mother's Day. That way, it would be a three-day holiday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We all like three-day holidays. By making the first Monday in May a federal holiday for Mother's Day, it gives more people an opportunity to, to uh, get out of town, go see your mother, wherever she's uh, living or wherever she's buried, for people like us. So the first Monday in May would be Mother's Day. The first Monday in June, then, of course, would be Father's Day. Let's make the first Monday in June Father's Day because all of us had a mother, most of us had a father, some of us didn't. So the first Monday in June would be Father's Day. Then the 4th of July, a combination of Independence Day, Memorial Day, and Veterans Day. We'd make the 4th of July Patriotism Day because now we have Veterans Day. Hi, Rob Sherman, running for Congress, 5th yeah. Congressional yeah. District. <laughs> and I know who you are. You're Kim Fox, right? No, no. Oh, you're Bernie. <laughs> <No. laughs> okay. So, uh, a lot of people, Veterans Day comes along, hey, it's just a day off, they don't care. Memorial Day comes along, it's just a day off, they don't care. So I'm proposing we make the 4th of July Patriotism Day for Memorial Day, Independence Day, and Veterans Day. We've got four holidays to go here. You'll love the last one. But the next one's the first Monday in August. That would be Children's Day. Nobody, you know, we, we all love children, but do we love them enough to give them a holiday, to put on a holiday in their honor? Well, they're all going back to school in the middle of August or the end of August, so let's make the first Monday in August, Children's Day, federal holiday, three-day weekend. 
That's August. Then in September, Constitution Day. Constitution Day is September 17th. Birthday of the Constitution, September 17th from 1787. Well, I'm proposing that we make the third Monday in September a combination of Constitution Day and Labor Day. So we commemorate Labor Day. These are combination holidays. So, so we uh, can com commemorate multiple things at one time. So the third Monday in September would be a combination of Constitution Day and Labor Day. Fourth Thursday in November would be Thanksgiving. We Yay. keep Thanksgiving because everybody likes Thanksgiving. That's the day we atheists give thanks to all the farmers for growing the food. Thanksgiving Day. Yay. All right. When? When? Uh, same as now, fourth Thursday in November would be Thanksgiving Day because we need to give thanks to the farmers for growing all those food, all that food. Yeah. Now, you'll love our, my last holiday of the year in December. We would eliminate December 25th as a federal holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Why do the Christians get their holiday special treatment and all the rest of us? We don't get our holiday special pagan? treatment. Right. Are you a pagan? We're, we're not at the point. What about Rosh Hashanah? We're not at the Rosh point in the presentation where we're taking comments. That'll come later. So and hold on to it. Hold on to it. No, I'm not excusing. It's my turn. I have the microphone. I have the microphone, and you you can respond later. One fool at a time. Yeah. We need That's to have right. Rosh Hashanah. Re respond later. Okay. So let's get rid of December 25th as a federal holiday and replace that with December 31st, Science Day. We all want to educate our kids. So here's the punchline, ladies and gentlemen. Instead of getting stupid on religion on December 25th, let's get smart on science on December 31st. All right. How about atheists? Not only that, well, it, here are some of the benefits of making December 31st Science Day. We could also make that a national gifting day. So it's good for the economy. We extend the holiday shopping season by a week by making Science Day a national gifting day on December 31st. We also have a situation in this country where a lot of Christians including that nice lady over there that, that was heckling me. A lot of Christians want to put Christ back into Christmas. How do you do that? Get the government out of it. Right? You agree with me, right? A lot of people want to put Chris, want to put Christ back into Christmas. Let's do that. Let's put Christ back into Christmas by eliminating Christmas as a federal holiday, make it a personal holiday for those for whom Christmas is important, and that way, instead of having the government make it bland and neutral, the Christians can make it as Christian <coughs> as they want. Ah, okay. All right, what a pause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, and then we extend the uh, we extend the holiday shopping season by week. And one more thing, by keeping New Year's Day as a holiday and Science Day on December 31st. Now, every year, we're going to have a four-day weekend. We all like three-day weekends, but we all love four-day weekends. This would be an official four-day weekend because if one of those days uh, happens on a Saturday or a Sunday, we just kick it out to, to Monday or back to Friday. So we'll always have a four-day weekend at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year. So I, I have a few other uh, issues, but... But that, that, that should give you a little taste of what's going on. I'll be happy to take your questions at this point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, tell, tell me your first name again. I remember who my you name is, My name is Pat Butler, and I'm I am not running for office. I'm glad you remember that, Pat. Because you know, when you get to our age, sometimes you forget things like that. That's why I wore the shirt. Well, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, I'm Rob Schirmer. Speak for right. yourself. Would you <laughs> consider, for, in is. a spirit of compromise, would you consider for the December holiday, yeah. instead of Science Day, which is awful cold and bland, why not have, <laughs> are we being treated to some kind of a... <laughs> no, no, you, you know, I, I forgot my name, so I want it up here where I can see it better. Yeah. Da, 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 why, don't we, da, da, da. why don't we have December's holiday yeah. uh, being a modern <laughs> version of Saturnalia, a festive time, a yes. feel-good time, 
where we can individually praise our one or many gods and uh, have uh, parties which put the average New Year's bash to shame uh, as the ancient Romans did. And yeah. trees. Well, the reason is that most people are unfamiliar with the concept that you're proposing and the, the concept here that I'm proposing is something that, that most people can relate to, most people are familiar with. So most people know about science and it's a combination of Science Day, National Gifting Day, so I would accomplish your agenda and you know we still have to deal with all those Christian Republicans uh, in Congress that would be opposed to, you know, anything an atheist proposes, they'll be against, just like anything Barack proposes, they're against. So, well, I, I'm trying to, to put, the, you know, again, this, this is a starting point, and, and your idea would be considered, and then we'll see what the other 434 members of Congress so would, would uh, agree to. But you see, this would be totally inclusive, because as you may or may not know, the date for Christmas was set by the early Christians, uh, by the early church, to coincide with the Feast of Saturnalia. I don't disagree with what you're saying. The problem is that uh, decisions in Congress are based on what's popular. So I'm trying to come up with something that would be sufficiently popular to pass. Let me move on and give somebody else a turn. You had a question here. Um, I'm familiar with, more with the Green Party in, um, in Europe and here. Uh, you didn't say anything about the Green Party or the, you know, any of the, the, the platforms. Uh, that represent the party that you're you're running on, um, right? Um, so my question is: is yeah. is the American Green Party um, uh, closely aligned uh, with, with the goals of the Green? Here's the answer to your question: the Illinois Green Party subscribes to the ten key values that uh, uh, Green parties across the country, uh, ac around the world, subscribe to. So th that's why I'm a member of the Green Party. Things like uh, 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 something democracy, I'm, I'm trying to, well, grassroots democracy, uh, environmental, respect for diversity, uh, uh, respect for women, uh, all, all those types of things. That's, that's a given that I subscribe to the, to the 10 key values in whole or for the most part. And, and all candidates for uh, office in Green Party uh, either subscribe to that or they shouldn't be running as a Green. I subscribe to that. You're next. You're next. If I could follow up. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, please. The, the funniest thing I ever read in the Chicago Tribune yeah. was an interview with you at your home. Oh, uh, with when Ricky. It starts was, with an A. was little and he was asked and yeah. he was prodded, it starts with an A. Yeah. Could you tell that? Absolutely. It's so funny. Sure. It's so funny. Sure. This was okay. uh, Eric Zorn. You guys know Eric oh, Zorn, yeah. columnist yeah. with the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he uh, came by the house uh, to uh, do the interview and uh, talk to Ricky because he was the plaintiff in our Pledge of Allegiance lawsuit where we were challenging the state law that says the Pledge of Allegiance shall be recited daily by public school students and so we challenged the law on the basis that in a country that guarantees freedom of speech you can't have a law that provides for mandatory speech and in a country that guarantees freedom of religious opinion you can't have a law that requires any citizen but in particular a child to renounce the opinion about religion taught at home and profess the exact opposite opinion in order to participate in a government program namely public education so I said to Ricky okay Ricky what are we Ricky he goes huh you know he's six years old I said Ricky it starts with an A oh Assholes. <laughs> Got it. Uh, that's not what I had in mind, Ricky, but Eric printed it. <laughs> Gentlemen in the back. All right, uh, so Mr. Rob Sherman, on Tuesday, I'm going to go vote. Please do. Now, I want to vote for you. Now, here's the big key. When yeah. I go to the person at the, at the, at the desk, yeah. she, she, you got a computer, I give my address. Yeah. And then they say, what kind of ballot do you want? You want the Green Party ballot. Ah, uh, and is oh. there such a thing as a Green Party ballot? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Or you, yeah. or you combine with the Democratic no, Party? No, no, that, that's a different party. Yeah, yeah, you you know, there, there are you three parties that. that you can ask for. There's there's the two corporate parties. There, there's the Democratic Party, that's blue. And the Republican Party, that's red. And then there's the Green Party. If you want a Green Party ballot, Ask for a Green Party ballot. Punch 41, Rob Sherman. Did you know that, Celeste? 
I'm number 41 on the ballot. Punch 41, and a, a, and then you'll be voting for me. There's a and, fourth ballot, independent. Tim. Uh, are they? Uh, do they have a primary? Oh. See, here's here's what's going on. In those <laughs> with those established parties that have contested races, that's where you have a primary. The Green Party, the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party are uh, regarded as established. You're not established political parties, and where we have contested races, uh, that's that's where you have a primary to decide which of the candidates running for the nomination of their party for that office uh, will be the candidate in November. So please ask for a Green Party ballot, punch 41, vote for Rob Sherman, and then uh, I will be on the ballot against Mike Quigley in November. And the benefit of that is that uh, it, it puts these issues, it, uh, it, it gives these issues life so that these issues can be discussed and debated. So whether I win or lose uh, in November, uh, these issues will be raised and uh, perhaps some of these issues, whether it's just things like O'Hare or uh, red light cameras, revenue scam cameras, the best issues can be uh, implemented into law can be enacted into law, but that won't happen if I'm not on the ballot. Gentleman in the back. Okay, thank you. I'm dead this myself. Which one? Which one? Gen gentleman over there in the back. Sorry. I have uh, a quick two part question. Two parts. Loud, loud, please. Come on. I'm up here, I can hear you better. Loud, please. I, I kind of like that um, one second per 10 miles per hour. Well, that's a standard rate. Right, because I, I researched it once, and yeah, Chicago does have a lot, the shortest yellow lights in the country. That's right. So my question is, one, uh, what? how much did he shorten it by? You know, you told us it's shorter. Right. And if there's a formula. Two, can you enunciate again what you're going to do about O'Hare jet noise? Yes. And then th three, sorry, three. Uh, why is wait uh, quickly wait. used? Hold, hold on to three. I'll come back to you for follow up, and that'll be three. You, okay. We'll do the three in the follow up. But in regards to uh, the revenue scam cameras, Rom shortened the cameras, some of them to 3.0 seconds, some of them to 2.9 seconds, some even to 2.8 seconds, and shorten it as much as he can to trick people, to fake people out so that they end up with tickets that they had no intention of getting because the yellow light was shortened to an artificially short length for the purpose of scamming people out of their money. Mm -hmm. In regards to O'Hare jet noise, I'm a pilot. And uh, right now, the, uh, the FAA has a series of waypoints, also known as intersections, also known as fixes, F-I-X-E-S, fixes, where when a jet takes off, doesn't matter which runway they take off on, they have to follow that route and go over these waypoints and, and be over these waypoints at a specific altitude. So if you take off this way, you turn that way. If you take off this way, you still go that way. Take off this way, you got to turn that way to get out of the Chicago area 30 or 40 miles. What I will propose mm. is so like that over fries. forest preserves. I, I didn't hear you. Like over uh, forest sure. preserves or over expressways? Over specific oh, intersections. It's still going to be loud in here. Okay. Right. So I will propose that the FAA create a new series, uh, 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 a lot of new routes using GPS. And that way, uh, you know, we, we could have 20 or 30 or 40 different routes. And, you, uh, and one week we're going to use route number one. Next week we use route number two. Next week we use route number three. And vary the routes so that way you don't need to keep the diagonal runways open. You can use yeah. the east-west well, runways. The pilots and the airlines won't like that, I'm sure. Well, that, that's why I'm proposing uh, the legislation. Gentlemen back there. Oh, but you, you had a third yeah, why, why a follow up. What was the third follow up? Why, yeah, why, why is Quigley uh, useless? He does seem useless. Yeah. He goes to Iraq, he plays hockey. Who? Quigley. <laughs> okay. He doesn't seem like he's much engaged. I think he's, he's an incumbent that wants to stay there for a long time. That's why you need to vote for me on Tuesday. But give me some uh, red meat. March 15th. <laughs> Ask for that Green Party ballot. No, why is quickly a bad guy is what I'm asking. 
Uh, I am running, no, a very serious answer to your question. I am running to uh, implement my agenda. I'm not running against Quigley, I'm running for my agenda. And Quigley can do what Quigley does, I'm doing what I do, and the gentleman in the back has the next question. Yeah, well, uh, no one. You know, for this talk, said you wanted to get rid of income taxes. I didn't hear anything about that. I didn't hear anything about the usual grain of subject. Let me talk to you about income taxes. Income taxes. Okay. Income taxes. I propose, and that's in my agenda too, I am proposing that we eliminate income taxes and replace income taxes with a consumption tax, a federal sales tax, because that way, instead of spending, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 or 200 or 300 hours a year trying to figure out how much do I really owe, and instead of spending another 300 hours trying to come up with, with ways to wiggle out of uh, tax liabilities, come up with little tricks and scams, let's just do a straightforward tax that everybody can understand. It's simple. Cayman Islands has a consumption tax. They don't have a federal income tax in the Cayman Islands. Uh, so, uh, and, and people pay the tax, and, and, and the government operates fine, and if the government needs more money, they, they uh, increase the income tax by half a percent or by a percent, but that way it's real simple, and people talk about, oh, it's regressive. No, it's not, because right now, if, if rich people, uh, you know, if, if people making $20,000 a year spend $20,000 a year, they pay and they pay 10 percent on income taxes. They're paying two thousand dollars a year. But meanwhile, rich people make two million dollars a year with all their tax deductions and tax evasions and tax breaks. They may only pay out of that two million dollars if they pay. Uh, you know, they also may only pay two thousand dollars a year. So if we make it a consumption tax based on a percentage of what you buy, if you Make two million dollars a year. You spend two million dollars a year. Your taxes are two hundred thousand. No wiggling out of it. So I I support a consumption tax. I think that's a much better tax. You had a question here. Yeah, I think the Green Party wants us to drive fuel efficient cars, to conserve energy in our homes, and not pollute, to recycle. And you're flying around in a private airplane. That don't sound like that don't sound like it's fuel efficient. And I think private airplanes. Like all their planes are high polluters. Okay, it's a it's a good question. There's nothing wrong with this question. Don't fool them. It, it's a it's a legitimate okay. It's a legitimate question. Here's the answer. Number one, my plane gets 20 miles to the gallon, and it flies in a direct line. So the the effective rate is maybe 30 miles to the gallon. So it's just as efficient. As, as a high efficiency car. But also you should know that there is new technology on the way. There are already airplanes that operate on electric engines and more are coming uh, and, and more energy efficient engines are coming using alternative uh, fuel sources. So it's efficient already and getting more efficient, but it is a proper question and I thank you for asking it. I'm All right, waiting, I'm waiting. Uh, well, the gentleman in the back had the next question. Yeah. Uh, getting back to the question before this one, you're talking about your 10% consumption tax. No, I, I'm not specifying a percentage. I use 10% okay. as an example. Okay. It could be 2%, it could be 20%. I don't know yet. For the 47% of the people in this country who don't pay any federal income taxes anyway. Right, right. Since they're going to get stuck with some of your consumption tax, why yeah. not on dealing with that? Yeah. Because well, they're not going to like you. That, that's right. They're not. And that's why <laughs> I propose this. There are a lot. You're next. There are a lot of people. So be ready. There are a lot of people who don't pay taxes, but they buy stuff. So yeah. if we have a consumption tax, then they will be into the taxation system. Your turn. Thank you. Yes, dear. Um, I had the privilege of living in Germany. I'm very familiar with the Grünen, uh, the Green Party. And 
The Green Party has been elected in places like Mexico, Brazil, Spain. Um, my question is, I have two things. With all respect, you know, okay. freedom of speech, what I tried to say at the beginning is that this country was founded on the Judeo-Christian culture, Jewish and Christian. Let yourself so that's all. I mean, you don't know where the religion is. I may be a Buddhist, you don't know. But what I'm saying is freedom of religion is dangerous to go and attack the Judeo-Christian culture because the radical Muslims, that's what they want. And if you go to Europe, like in Germany, Scandinavia, <laughs> one of the things why they have been almost taken over the radicals because they are good Muslims and I know many of them. Uh, the question is, which percentage in Chicago and instead of Illinois representatives of the Green Party? Have you elected? How many have been elected to the Green Party in Chicago? I don't know how many people have been elected, and that's not the basis of my campaign. The basis of my campaign is, here are the merits of my campaign, vote for me if you feel my campaign is meritorious. In regards to your first concern that you mentioned about uh, uh, religious bigotry or religious discrimination, one of the other planks on my campaign, in my campaign, is to eliminate the anti-atheist religious graffiti from our money. Because not all of us trust in some make-believe deity parent named God. I also want to eliminate the anti-atheist religious editorial in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Because Iran is one nation under God. We're one nation under a constitution. So it's time for us to get rid of the anti-atheist religious editorial from the pledge. How about doing the pledge of allegiance? Hold on for a second. The pledge of allegiance no longer is an act. Uh, it is a ceremony. Uh, uh, it's no longer a ceremonial act of patriotism. That's the phrase I was looking for. Uh, when there was a constitutional challenge, uh, a court challenge to uh, uh, one nation under God in the pledge, the federal courts, the, the religious justices on the Supreme Court, you know, six Christians, three Jews, we didn't have our people up there, they said that the phrase under God has lost its religious significance due to rote repetition. Well, if that's the case, then certainly uh, the uh, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance has lost its patriotic significance due to rote repetition and now is merely the ceremonial bullying of atheists. It has nothing to do with patriotism whatsoever. So I want to eliminate the ceremonial bullying of atheists and I also want to give the next question to Charlie. The, 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 the big guy. Is okay? All right, Charlie. Uh, presuming Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, is not elected president of the United States, which of the three candidates, Mr. Trump, Hillary, or Bernie, do you think is going to offer the best opportunities for legislation that you can support? I mean, what do you think of these three remaining candidates? As a Green Party candidate for public office, my loyalty is supposed to be to the Green Party candidate for president. I'm also realistic. Jill Stein is not going to be the next president of the United States. I, am, I have great doubt that she'll even make it on the ballot in Illinois. It is not the job of members of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party to decide who the candidate of the Green Party is going to be, but similarly, it is not the job of people in the Green Party to decide who the candidate of the Republican Party or the, who the candidate of the Democratic Party is going to be. So we'll wait to see, you, know, you can have me back to speak later in the year, we'll wait to see who the candidate. 
Well, no, it's, it, you know, I, I'm atheist on this subject. Uh, it's the job, it, it's the prerogative of the Republicans to select the person that they prefer. It's the job of the Democrats to select the candidate that they prefer, and once they make their selections, we'll see who's on the ballot in November. And you have an yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> first, 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 hold it for a second. I, I didn't hear your follow-up, Charlie. Tell me again. No, no, no first of all, I want to apologize for coming in late. I it's okay. Really but for a second, a second. Wait, wait, stop for a second. I'm glad you did because uh, now I don't have to feel bad that I'm the only one that shows up late every once in a while. Good. It, it's, it's other people who do it too. So okay. thank you for making okay. 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 feel now, like now I'm I have a, Okay, now I have a question. Oh, okay. Well first, done. you uh, you're running for Congress, and and the the and this the congressional district. I heard the congressional district it, that you are running for Congress in is currently held by Mike Quigley, Democrat. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, so my question is this: Are is, are any Republicans running for this congressional uh, seat as well? Yes and no, which means the uh, question is, are any Republicans running? And my answer is yes and no, and what that means is no Republican has filed. So there is no Republican on the ballot in the primary. Oh. However, the, Repu the established parties, including the Republican Party, have the right to appoint somebody to be their candidate for Congress in the 5th Congressional District, and it, it is customary for them to do so. So it's likely that they will have a candidate, but it sure would be fun to have a one-on-one -on -one with Mike Quigley. So that answers your question. Uh, gentlemen here. In 2012, uh, the two major parties in this country uh, wealthy, beyond belief, powerful, influential, uh, that you could compare them to any empire or kingdom in history, denied uh, Jill Stein participation in the presidential debates. Now, we have thousands of choices in supermarkets. I didn't hear you. Thousands of what? Thousands of choices in supermarkets of what products to buy. But when it comes to our democracy, we're forced to either the blue side or the red side right. of the Trojan horse of right. big money, big influence, and big power. Uh, you know, a lot of authors talk about freedom of speech. One of my favorites is George Orwell. Is there a question? Don't we have a crisis of lack of freedom of speech in this country when we can't have three people, when we have thousands of choices in a grocery store, right. we can't have three people talk about public policy? I completely disagree with the premise of your question. Here's why. I am all for the First Amendment. I am all for freedom of speech. Therefore, the people who organize a, de a debate, just like, you know, I don't see any Democrats or Republicans at the podium with me tonight. I've got the floor all to myself. Hey, terrific. I think that's great. I don't, I don't want to compete against Mike Quigley for your attention tonight. Let him come in. Next Saturday, no. after him, no. or, or let him come in. Let him come in on November fifteenth, after the election is over and he's lost to me. So, so there's nothing wrong with people who organize a debate exercising their First Amendment right to decide who they want to participate in the debate. And then if somebody doesn't like it, well, they can organize their own debate. And that's exactly what happened. And Jill Stein was in a debate. I'll give you a follow-up. Jill Stein was in a debate with some guy from the Constitution Party and some guy from the Libertarian Party and some guy from another party. I don't even remember which one, what it was called, uh, Truth and Justice, or something like that. That's what the First Amendment. Say that again. Is the Peace and Freedom Party? I don't remember. Okay. Might have been, might not have been, probably wasn't, but it doesn't matter. The, the issue is anybody, you know, if, you know what, I have a solution to your issue. Charlie, let's invite uh, the uh, uh, Democrat uh, candidate for president, the Republican candidate for president, and the Green Party candidate for president. We'll limit to those three. We'll bring them here into Dapper's East. Oh. And uh, the, then we'll have a, uh, of course, we'll also invite in Channel 9 because they're from right down the block. 
Uh, <laughs> and and so, so the point is, anybody can organize a debate, but First Amendment means that whoever organizes the debate, it's their choice, it's their prerogative as to who participates in the debate. I, and I mentioned that you're next. Okay. I have a quick follow-up. All right, well, another quick follow-up. Go ahead. Okay. It's okay. So, fair enough. That's a good answer. Uh, but don't we still have a constitutional crisis when they locked her to a chair and kept her in a room, you know, for hours and hours on, like some kind of criminal, just because she wanted to participate in the debate? That seems to me like something we could call the United Nations and have them do an investigation into. Uh, well, I disagree with you for this reason. Like it's not, it's not like she was holding a gun. She was well, bringing her oh, point. I disagree with you for this reason. The organizers of the debate said. Who hears? Just like you know, Charlie decided who's going to be in the debate tonight. It's going to be me. Well, the organizers of the debate decided it's going to be uh, uh, Barack and uh, uh, was it Mitt Romney? Okay, so do me rock. Well, the organizers of the debate have a right to do that, and Jill should not be interfering with that, and Jill should not be threatening to interfere with that. She should respect their constitutional rights to uh, uh, invite whoever they want to be in the debate. That's my opinion, that's my perspective, and you have that next question. Um. Yeah, you didn't bring out a lot of things, like our, our uh, involvement in foreign aggressions around the world, global warming, a minimum wage, and things of that nature. So how do you stand on those issues? Right, I'm glad you asked. Here's why I didn't bring those things up. This presentation is supposed to last about 30 or 45 minutes. Now, I mentioned that I brought a printout of my campaign website, of the, of the campaign homepage, and in here, look, it goes 14 pages. We, we could be here, you know, they close this place down at 9 o'clock. They kick us out at 9 o'clock. I could still be talking. If I wanted to talk about all those issues, we'd be here past nine o'clock just listening to me and then all of my friends here and all of my closest friends in the world you know the people who come to the college of complex meetings every saturday night uh you never have an opportunity so it's part of a balance here's a taste of what i'm talking about and if you want to know more about my campaign robsherman.com those are my issues do you have a specific issue that you'd like to know about i'd like oh how do you say it? on the United States, all these foreign aggressions that we take part in. Uh, it, it's a very difficult situation. And, and uh, uh, what I would do, I would uh, listen to various, uh, uh, I would get the advice from a variety of people, uh, look at proposals before Congress, and then make, uh, make decisions. And you have the next question. Uh, I would like to know, you know, I hear a lot of the same thing from politicians everywhere. We're going to go in and we're going to change this. We're going to go in, we're going to change that. We're going to stick to our principles. We've had the Tea Party go up and obstruct Congress so they can't pass a budget. We've had, in Illinois, a, a, a venture capitalist run for governor who's basically got no budget. Right. You've had the Republicans in Washington, D.C. play politics with government shutdown. How? I'd like to know where you stand and how you're going to get this problem Great solved. Great question. I have an answer for you. All right. All right. Uh, it's a two-part answer, and then you're going to have the next question, so be ready. First, in regards to the gridlock, I was asked about this at a previous debate. What am I going to do about the gridlock in Washington? One of my greatest skills is cooperation. I can get along with anybody. I can bring people together. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Celeste, the perfect wife, perfect in every way, best wife a guy could ever have. Celeste and I are still together after more than 42 years, ladies and gentlemen. We've been, we've been married. Stand up. We've been married for over 37 years. We've been uh, buddies. So she's been my girlfriend for over 42 years. 
if I didn't know how to get along with people, if I didn't know how to cooperate, she would have kicked my ass out of the house a long time ago. She's a saint. And, and she's, she's a still... beautiful wife. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the oh, most bad, important <laughs> reason of the whole night for you to vote for me. She's a martyr. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Celeste has been suffering through dealing with me for over 42 years. If you vote to send me to Washington for two years, watch the reaction on Celeste's face. If you send me to Washington for two years, for Celeste it's going to be freedom! Yeah! Celeste, look at the big smile! So, even if you don't like my agenda, Celeste needs a break, ladies and gentlemen. Give Celeste a break for a couple of years. Give Celeste a, a two-year vacation from dealing with me. You know, every night I score in her ear. Is it bothering you, Celeste? Oh, no, it's fine. But you know it's bothering her, so send me to Washington. Uh, I know that uh, it's a tradition here to give you guys an opportunity to come up here and pontificate. So I will close at this point, and uh, I'll be around for a while. Uh, I, I think I've given everybody at least one opportunity. My soup's getting cold, so let's let people come up to the front <laughs> All right. and tell us how you feel. Thank you for a long guy. Thank you. Who's Ed Grossman? Wave your hand, Ed Grossman. Ed. Ed? Okay. You your turn, question. Ed. Your turn for a question. The last question. The last question is to Ed. Ed. Um, with what's going on in Washington and where the Republicans have to stop everything that President Obama wants to do, and many things that were good for us and would have been good for us, like how are you on single-payer health care? I have a two-part answer. You're going to love the second part. In regards to single-payer health care, I really haven't studied that issue closely enough, but I, I know that the Celeste and I have excellent health care, and we want to be able to continue to utilize you know, the first-class services that we have. So the, there, there are a variety of very good and very strong perspectives uh, regarding uh, uh, single-payer health care. I, uh, as you see, I have a lot of issues. That's an issue I'll have to study more closely. But I want to comment on something else that was brought up, and, and that pertains to the gridlock, and in particular, the gridlock in Springfield, Illinois, where we have a governor who says that uh, unless you cave into my demands to screw the middle class, I'm not going to approve the budget. Ladies and gentlemen, this will come as news to you in regards to two different things. First, I am working on getting Bruce Runner impeached. Here's why. Bruce Runner has made a number of appointments to boards and commissions, like the Tollway Board, the Illinois Finance Authority, Illinois Sports Authority. In many, if not most cases, he's appointed either all men or all men and one woman. In some cases with a large board, 17 members, all men and two women. Ladies and gentlemen, Illinois has a law called the Gender Balanced Appointments Act. And the Gender Balanced Appointments Act, it comes from a section of law, same section of law as the Open Meetings Act and the Freedom of Information Act. Gender Balance Appointment Act requires, it's a mandate, it's not a suggestion, it requires that all boards and commissions shall be gender balanced. The Tollway Board, thanks to Bruce Schroner, has nine men and no women. There are other boards that, that are in similar situations. I've been in touch with Bruce's office and demanded that they respond and say, what are you doing about this? But uh, he refuses to do anything and so I've gone to uh, one particular state representative, uh, Mary Flowers, and I'm working with her on getting uh, articles of impeachment against Bruce if he doesn't uh, end his practice of blatant discrimination against women. What's the recall process for uh, recalling the governor? There, there is no recall. What I'm looking to no. do is to get Ronner impeached because 
the Illinois Constitution stipulates that the government, that, that the governor shall be responsible for the faithful enforcement of all laws. He's not obeying that law, he's not enforcing that law, he is defying that law, and if that's what he's going to do, let's impeach him and put somebody else in, the lieutenant governor, and maybe she will obey the law. So thank you. Let me give everybody an opportunity to, to come up here and speak. Meanwhile, my soup is uh, almost cold, and so I'm going to go grab my soup, grab myself. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Five minutes apiece. Five minutes apiece. All right, and Tim Bolger has the first rebuttal. Can I have the next? You know, I'd like to say real quick. Rob? Yes, sir. I like your platform on some things, but in other things, I strongly disagree. That's okay. Let me ask you an important question. All right. Do you like my t-shirt? <laughs> Your t-shirt's fine, but I think you should have been, uh... Do you like my wife? Yes. What? Hey, what about one fool at a time? Tim, Tim, is, Tim is, supposed, is the speaker now. Let, you let see, him go. Rob, one thing you got to realize. The United States is an empire. We are, we're currently acting like a 17-year-old running that empire. What needs to happen is the United States needs to grow up and start acting like a proper empire and not and respect other countries' borders. But there are three things that need to happen to keep this self a safe and prosperous world. The first is to keep the sea lanes open and respected with all ships, all traffic. And the only way you're really going to do that is by having a large navy. The United States can both go to the Atlantic and the Pacific ports and exercise influence. And the other area is going to be space. And the reason why they respect this right now is because of a large defense budget. That is where the whole crux of the matter is going to be. Number two, you got to keep the goods flowing. Not only do you maintain open sea lanes, but you try to keep the barriers of the movements of goods and capital and people down between countries so that the free enterprise system can flourish. And probably the final thing that most people don't really realize, you got to keep globalization a growing. What that, no, what that simply means is that in most other countries around the world, the poor don't have access to the capital goods like we do. They don't have access to banks. They don't have a stable address. It's that they can't set up a business legally, so it's done in the extra legal sphere. Take a look at The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto, who was in the Institute for Liberty and Democracy in, in Peru. You don't believe me on keeping the, keeping the sea lanes open and all that sort of stuff? Check out Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. And then, of course, the other book by another author by the name of Thomas Friedman, A Forecast for the Next Hundred Years. Our demographics are poised to keep us in a good position open for the next hundred years or so. Our economy is the largest in the world, bigger than the next seven combined. What do we need to do to keep everything going? We need to be a law-abiding nation. We need to maintain global <clears throat> standards. Now, you talk about global warming. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The only way we're going to get out of it is through some other form of nuclear power. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, that's going to be thorium molten salt reactors. Yes! And that's going to mean oh. something else. I don't, you know, the, the thing is, electricity is such a basic need for development that when you can get a, a reactor the size of this room at atmospheric pressure that runs safe and can power an entire north side of a city of Chicago like this, I like this a lot better than having to take a entire 40, 150 acres of solar and wind panels, which will truly devastate the environment. Yes, to summarize, you keep the sea lanes open, you keep the goods a flowing, and you keep globalization a growing. Yeah! Tim! Tim! I'm afraid I've been derelict to my duty. I should ask how many. Five minutes, Dustin. <laughs>
We can line up. All right. Uh, how much time please? We're going to go five minutes each because some will be short. We're going to have enough time. All right. It's now 7.43. I went four minutes. Hopefully some people will be short. I'm under six minutes. Okay. okay. There's going to be a timer here. A very entertaining. Mike thank you. The, I don't need to be introduced, but uh, thank you anyway. The, the talk was very entertaining, but uh, this country is uh, facing a lot of problems. Uh, uh, our uh, economic system is, is pushing us in further into down the toilet. Timer's here. And I don't see how we're uh, rising the, the list of holidays is, is going to solve our nation's problems. Um, um, there was some good uh, stuff there, though. The anti-bullying, absolutely. I agree with the anti-bullying. I have a, a nephew. He just turned uh, 17, and he's moved up here um, from uh, northern Virginia. Um, his, uh, his mother, uh, my, my, uh, my sister, um, uh, passed away, and he's come up here to live with us, and he's going to Taft High School. But he was the victim of bullying down there in Prince William County, where there was a recent murder. Uh, uh, the, uh, the deputy that was her first day on the job, she got murdered, that was um, in Prince William County. And uh, uh, my nephew went to, um, to um, um, uh, high school there, and he came down with uh, cystic acne. It's like the worst acne you can have. And he was subjected to so much bullying. And then when I went there after my sister's death to help out, uh, I saw the, the thing from his dermatologist, a copy of the note. He says, if you cannot prevent this young man from being bullied because of his disease, then you must allow him to receive instruction at home. And they, he, re, he ended up receiving instruction at home because they could not, re, you know, and I, I, I hate to say it, and this is an offensive term, uh, but those redneck hillbillies there subjected him to the worst bullying that you can imagine because of, of a medical condition. And uh, don't quote me on, on, on saying a redneck hillbilly because uh, I may want to run for president someday. But it's, <laughs> it, it's a very disturbing thing. Oh, my God. On the oaths, okay. Um, I, I, I was cited for... Uh, I had to go to administrative court. I like to rock out, and I guess I was playing my music too loud, and I forgot to close the window. And um, the, the judge uh, said, um, uh, you know, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? And I says, uh, I thought I would be given the opportunity uh, to affirm. And she says, uh, yeah, you, you can answer appropriately. And I says, but the question isn't appropriate. You're supposed to say, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth? And then you say, I so affirm. She gave you 30 but days uh, the I made that thing, but the, the, the judges aren't following that thing. They're not giving you the option outright uh, of the option to, to swear or affirm. And, um, okay, you know, like Rob, I'm an atheist for God's sake. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm uh, I'm at least a quarter Jewish for Christ's sake. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but uh, okay, uh, you know he mentioned he was late, and I, I think I have to call him out and call back Zorn to you know I have to out this guy. I, I think he was observing Shabbat. <laughs> that's why he was late, okay? All Thank right, you. all right, all right. <laughs> all right, brother. Way to go, man. Way to go. This is Halloween. Thank you. Wrong. All these holidays you mentioned, there's one holiday you did not mention which should be required, and that is should, we should have a, next, uh, a national holiday uh, for voting. For what? For voting. For voting. It should be a day, a day, a holiday for voting. You should get the day off for voting. We don't get it. Now Bernie, I believe, has supported it. Or he's mentioned it. National holiday for voting. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is pledge allegiance to the flag of the under God. How about under the Constitution? I like that. 
Yeah. You can pledge it under the Constitution. These are republics to go along with that, right? Okay, that's it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Oh. All right. All right. All right. This is a quote uh, from Charles no. Dickens' uh, American Notes. I'll do it. He writes, I saw in them the wheels that moved the meanest perversion of virtuous political machinery that the worst tools ever wrought, despicable trickery at elections, underhanded tamperings with public officers, cowardly attacks upon opponents, with scurrilous newspapers for shields and hired pens for daggers. Um, in light of that quote, I just want to read some of the uh, donors to the 2016 Clinton campaign. Uh, over 25 million from Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, between 10 million and 25 million, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Victor Pinchuk Foundation. Cheryl Heim Sabin and the Sabin Family Foundation. Between 5 million and 10 million from S. Daniel Abraham the state of Kuwait, the Coca-Cola company, between one million and five million donations from Boeing Company, Anheuser-Busch, Booz Allen Hamilton, Dow Chemical, Goldman Sachs, Exxon Mobil, Friends of Saudi Arabia, hmm. the son of Rupert Murdoch of Fox News fame, James Murdoch, James Murdoch, Walmart Foundation, the state of Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. Between five hmm. 100,000 and 1 million Bank of America, Chevron, Monsanto, Citigroup, News Corp, Foundation, the Soros Foundation, Soros. and the list goes on of a laundry list of violators of domestic and international law. And Trump's even worse, uh, but at least he exploited American workers to get his wealth. Uh, in America, you can have opportunity through politics either because the media tells the people uh, who's running and what the issues are, or you can have a lot of combination of and or a lot of money, or you can have a grassroots movement that says we've had enough of uh, same old, same old business as usual, we want actual democracy. I dream of the day when candidates like Rob Sherman and Jill Stein have the opportunity that those endless lists of dollars produce, because then we'll have a beautiful, beautiful, engaged, and inspired and participating public that can't be stopped. All right. Nice, nice, John. Nice, brother. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to They got somebody that's running for an office. He's a doctor and he's on 820. And he, he comes right out with it and says he's uh, against all these foreign wars because they're eating up our money and it's all it's doing is aggression against other countries and other things like global warming wasn't brought out at all. That's the most important issue there is in the world today because if we don't do anything about it, we won't have no world tomorrow. So these are very basic questions for anybody that's running for office and how they stand on that. Another thing, of course, people are desperate and that's why they're voting for uh, Bernie Sanders or Trump. Because the desperation is out there. Some people work for two, three jobs and can barely make it. And a lot of people are on the street and they can't make it. And people are very desperate, and that's why you see all this mayhem in the United States. Almost every week, you see somebody killing somebody else, mass murders, and things of that nature. And if you watch television, which I very little, uh, watch very little of, it's all you see is mayhem on there, and crime, and things of that nature. And so I see the United States and the capitalist world as a dying system. It's the decline and fall of the capitalist empire that is happening. So people that come along and just say a few things about holidays and things like that is not going to make a very great impression, I think, on people that are really desperate out there and want to hear something to solve their problems. And that's what people are looking for at this time. All right, all right, Brother Sid.
something nice and get rewarded in the afterlife. Uh, all these questions, I mean, I didn't hear the uh, reasons to be not, not <coughs> uh, for being against income tax, I think are about the least of the reasons for being against income tax. That's another speech altogether. Uh, The stuff about the holidays and the uh, red light cameras, I think, are a little too trivial to be putting into a federal campaign in this day and age. Yeah. Brother Bell, right? Bell. 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 Some of you know me, some of you hate me. They're probably the same people. Good stuff. Uh, tonight, our speaker. Ah, I'll give our speaker a lot of a lot of credit tonight. He said a lot of things that will probably tick off a lot of people, uh, especially his income tax stand, because I'm the one who asked the question about the 47 percent that don't pay now, and he says they're going to pay. Well, when they find that out, they're liable to lynch you. Uh, but I agree with it. <laughs> they probably should pay, but they're not going to. Another thing our speaker said was he's got a backup plan for everything if he gets to Congress until he gets one of them passed. Uh, it sounds like there's some very flexible principles there because he'll make a deal with anybody for anything. And that's what we've been accusing politicians of in Washington for years. So I guess there's nothing new there either. Uh, the Greens, as a party, I don't know, they'd be lucky on the national ballot because in half the states they aren't there and the other half of the states wish they weren't. Illinois is one of them. Uh, for congressional districts, they, they can't even run a candidate in all of them. Hmm. Uh, I was surprised to hear that the Republicans don't actually have a candidate in the 5th district and I know Matt, I'd have moved back to run just to piss them off. Uh, I wouldn't be the first person who's come to the college to do that. Yeah, I'd like to try that. Last night, Trump was supposed to speak in Chicago. Louder. And uh, we almost, I almost had a riot. Unfortunately, they didn't. Because the cops down there, their grandfathers were here in 68 on the force, and they were looking forward to it. Uh, believe me. Uh, it shows something about American college students today. They want a free education, but they're not going to put much on the line either. They're going to stand around, march, and hold a picket sign and say how bad America is, but I notice they want our money. They want that free education. Guess what? If America is so bad, why would you even want to go to school here? Think about it. You sound like a trumper. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, you I will smoke. post that sign on your front door. <laughs> Believe me, I will. Yeah. Sounds like a neo-fascist. Yeah, and, sounds like Trump every day. <laughs> and what's wrong with a neo-fascist? Oh, yeah, what's wrong with neo-fascist? Wait, wait, wait. What's wrong with a neo-fascist? Hey, wait. What are you going to do? Trick me out, Joe, or what? Give me remember. Extra time because of the hexagon. All right. What? Right. Right. You can't take it, Charlie, or what? You should be more ticked off than I do. You should cancel your rally. Wait, 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 wait one fool at a time. Well, cancel us No, call freedom of speech. Everybody gets the same right. I won't stop you from opening your mouth and making an ass out of yourself. You're not doing it to me either. You're right, brother. You're right. You're right. That's called freedom of speech, which, which it seems those students at Circle forgot. You're right. You're properly calling me out. It's yeah. like, okay. Freedom of speech on a college campus, and I went to Northeastern for a year, a couple years ago, 
It's about an outrageous amount of money and found that I still didn't like that school. Uh, I apologized already. I'm not talking about it's you now. <laughs> Uh, You're still you think Trump will apologize? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a free speech forum. Yeah. Of course you've got to deal with hecklers. Yeah. Uh -huh. so what makes, it's the only thing that gladdens this place up because half these people are asleep. Thank you. Listen, maybe Trump can bring more jobs. I don't know who's going to win. I voted in the primary of Reagan and I voted for Sanders because I don't like Hillary. <laughs> It didn't mean I probably, and I'll probably be forced to vote for Trump in this in November, what? because whichever Democrat winds up getting in, in the general election, I'm still not going to like worse. She told me she don't like you. Oh. Guess what? <laughs> I, I knew Hillary when she was a Goldwater girl, so don't give me that. Next, one of those guys, guys that listens to Nut Job Right Wing Radio. <laughs> All right, <laughs> it's off. It is off. Yeah, yeah just loud. Project. Just, All right. project. just project. All right. Dang, we need a woman. What is this? <laughs> Absolutely, we need a woman. Uh, I was a little disappointed in the explanation of louder. I was a little disappointed in the explanation of your red light camera. Oh, yeah. Uh, differences between the ROM rules, which I think was the daily rules originally. I didn't hear what you said. Disappointed in the explanation of what? I was ex dif uh, disappointed in your explanation of the, uh, the, uh, the length of the yellow lights on the red lights, uh, which I think daily implemented that, first of all. And ROM just said, okay, it's a catch cow. We'll just continue on. ROM shortened. Oh, it shortened it even. It was very short when Daly put right. the cameras in. It's shorter now with Ron. He's shorter now. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. I don't think the red lights are that important. I think speeding cameras are very important because those are much more dangerous. Speeders are responsible for a third of uh, all deaths on the roads. All right, so um, if you want to get elected, get on board the electric New York Chicago bullet train should be handling half of that traffic at O'Hare. Yeah. Okay, that's the yeah. biggest air polluter in Chicago, is O'Hare Airport. Yeah. Air pollution, Cars. noise pollution, carcinogen <laughs> pollution, all coming from that place. And Midway. Shouldn't even be near here. We're breathing it in all. And Midway, too. <coughs> I, I, worked, I was at an African-American church. I felt so bad for those people. They were right on the flight path. Oh, my God, is that loud. So, um by Midway. So anyway, I think one of the biggest problems is our dependence on oil. We're still fighting oil wars. ISIS is basically an oil war because that's um, Iraq's army, which Cheney and Bush invaded Iraq for oil contracts for Halliburton. So it disrupted the whole country. It all dispersed. And our military, the reason the Muslims hate us is because our military is so entrenched in, in we have Navy, we have Army, we have everything in the Middle East just surrounding the you know, Middle East. So I could see, you know, if, if Russia had, you know, bases in our country or Navy surrounding the Great Lakes, <laughs> I wouldn't like Russians much either or Chinese much either if they did that. So, but it's all because of the oil. So we got to start getting off of oil, and I don't know if it's thorium. For it's going to be thorium, dude. But that's just electricity. You know, that's only part of the equation. Oil is used for cars and airplanes, and trucks and buses and stuff. But mostly, it's for cars and airplanes. Get off oil and have to weed. We got to get off of oil as much as possible. So we got to build better, more and better transit systems. Start building electric bullet trains that could run on thorium, or wind, or solar, or any of the other stuff that um, can drive a, uh, an electric sustainable bullet train. So I will hand this out to the Green Party guy because he needs to be enlightened about transportation. Now your little trips down to Florida, if you're getting 20 gallons per mile, or 20 miles per gallon, 
<clears throat> that equates to 1,500 miles down to Florida. That's 75 gallons of gas one way, or jet fuel, or whatever you're using. And I believe, I believe the equation is 20 um, pounds of uh, greenhouse grasses, uh, gases per uh, gallon. I believe. It's only at 4.05. Ah, well, it's only at four minutes. Five. All right, damn. Done. Anyway, oh, come on. All right, so anyway, get on board with bullet, electric sustainable bullet trains and more transit, electronic transit. That's the future. There's a reason Europe has been built that for years and why China has spent billions. Question. Yes. The biggest problem with trains, even the bullet train, is that they don't have express trains point to point. They all stop along the way. Like if I take the Lake Shore Limited to eat from here to That's Amtrak. That's a whole different mode. They are supposed to make 20 stops on the way to New York. I'm talking about the TGV or what the Chinese built. or what the. It only stops in a couple major cities. Okay, but that, that's the biggest concern with the train. When it stops every 20 or 50 miles. No, the New York Chicago bullet train stops every 200 miles from here to New York. Okay. Only makes three stops. All right. So All give right. this to people in the Green how, Party. How fast does it take? But it can get to New York in four hours. Okay. PJ PJ Bay. Okay. PJ Bay. I'm the edge of the shit can't say. What is All right. I can't okay, imagine. Rob. Time uh, for our next speaker. One of the speakers uh, <laughs> took you to task for focusing on what were clearly very, very local issues of great concern to this district, the fifth district, but not as cosmic as some people would like. Right. I urge you to remember the words of uh, Tim O'Neill all politics is local. That's where it begins. You touched on some very hot button issues, and uh, those are the issues that re people really care about. Yes, a lot of Americans are concerned about us getting involved in wars uh, in parts of the world where they hate our guts and where we have nothing whatever to gain by being there. And yet we continue to pour millions and billions of dollars in lives and treasure and attention into a part of the world that if this were not mixed company, I would be able to describe it a little more freely. The fact of the matter is it has to do with a part of the anatomy uh, used for the disposal of waste. However, however, let's, let's not forget that there are things that a congressman needs to be involved in and you were going in that direction such as and it was touched on by other people here mass transit mass transit is going to be the transportation of the future in every major city because we can no longer provide even the room to park cars in cities like Chicago or New York or Washington DC or you know, any other place of a, a, a sizable population. We need mass transit, which until very recently has been neglected. Now, of course, the statistics are showing that, and you're going to be dealing with this if you get elected, uh, you're going to be dealing with the fact that uh, the CTA is perennially bankrupt, and yet the CTA is constantly getting more and more riders on the L. Less so on the buses, but that's because the buses uh, have not been properly deployed. Uh, we could have that conversation a little bit later sometime. The we fact will of the tonight. Pardon? We will tonight during my rebuttal. You'll love my response. I'm sure I will. Uh, because even though I disagree with your theology, uh, I like a lot of your ideas. And incidentally, incidentally, the only difference between you and the Archbishop of Chicago is that you say there is no hell, and Archbishop Kupis says the hell there isn't. Helen Dan. All right, I'll get you want the mic on? Okay.
Yeah. I get let me get the mic on for you. Hang on. Well, it's okay. It's okay. Please, your mic's on. Please, okay, talk into the microphone. Talk into the microphone. We got it on for you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much to the speaker and for the first amendment. I also believe in local uh, <laughs> politics, and we need to have different voices. Number two, I strongly believe that we can make changes if they're made state by the state. Um, this is talking about bringing jobs back to the United States. We can start doing it locally. Number three, why cannot we have more state universities or colleges which are almost free? Yes, we can. If we have given to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Egypt trillions of dollars which were wasted, we can use it in our children because the children are the future. We cannot forget that the minorities, African American, Latinos, Chinese, um, Middle Eastern, they have more children than white people. I have nephews and nieces. I was married twice. I don't have any children. Well, I have my nephews and nieces. So, a way to get away from poverty and welfare is education. Our children are living with 200000 and $100,000 debt. And if they cannot get jobs, how are they going to pay back? So I strongly believe that we need more free education. And then they can help when they're working. You know, it's small loans. Um, but we need to encourage more small businesses. My mother had uh, several small businesses, and this helped, although my father was an attorney, the fact that my mother was a working mother and had several small businesses that we could go to private schools. So I myself had, you know, some small businesses I also worked, but it's harder and harder to have a small business. And then, um, I have right on the TGV in France, yes, we can have these type of trains which only stop once or twice. So we can do it. Uh, solar energy, Israel has been having solar energy. And I have been, I've been blessed to be to Israel several times and they are running in solar energy. So we can do it state by state. We don't have to be a rock scientist. You can do a lot. You have the power. Your children, grandchildren, your nephew, your nieces. We have here a candidate who has different ideas. And although I don't agree with him and everything, I think it's very good. Thanks to his beautiful wife. But he said it thanks to her that he have the support from his wife and his family to run you know, from the Green Party. So I want to encourage all of you to really work in Chicagoland, in the state of Illinois, for the candidates. They don't have to be necessarily Democrats or Republicans. If they happen to be Democrat, that's fine, but they can be a Green Party, they can be independent, libertarians, or whoever, whatever, to run uh, local politics. And then the last but not the least, even if you don't like Donald Trump, he's shaking up the Republican establishment. <laughs> yeah. You know, shaking and <laughs> hopefully others would be united. And then uh, they said Hillary Clinton was the done deal. We are learning there is no such a thing as a done deal. Here we have Bernie Sanders. Thank you so much for your attention. And I can't help it but say the divine okay. bless America and the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Hey, Happy Patrick's Day. Right. Happy Saint right. Patrick's Day. Have you voted? <laughs> All right. So uh, let's thank our speaker. We've still got a few more rebuttal hours here, but 
I'm going to sneak in here. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. I got a number of things to go over here. I was not aware that the United States of America was, in fact, an empire, Tim. It is. But you seem oh, to think it is. I guess we've got some foreign you, policy Charlie. of colonization. So he's uh, a Marxist. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. He's a Marxist if he says that. So we can, we can go out and use that military of us and get some colonies. I mean, some real ones, you know, rich ones. We don't want the cheap ones, little poor ones. We want, you know, real. Let's be an empire builder. Yeah. All right. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you were advancing. You're you're telling the gentleman there, as, as a congressman, to please foster globalization. You know, because possibly there are some children in the world who don't have jobs in factories making stuff for Walmart. You know, so, um, yeah, this intermodal, this thing about sea lanes, I mean, you want to have intermodal containers, I guess, filled with plastic shit from China coming over here, <laughs> filling up Walmart, you know. The other thing, you were encour you're encouraging him as a congressman to, I guess, support research into alternative energy schemes, such as thorium nuclear reactors. And from my discussion with members of Congress, every now and then, every couple of days, some guy or gal shows up in the U.S. Congress and they've got some device or they need money for research that will solve the energy needs of the United States. And all they do is, well, they need a couple million dollars. And the congressmen say, you know, if you want to invest in something, why don't you go to a bank, this is the Congress of the United States, and we don't engage in, in venture capitalism. Uh, the other thing is, I got my friend over here, I was listening to you saying you were going to give instructions to the judge, or somehow or other, <laughs> which I don't think I'd recommend doing. <laughs> I won you're the going case. up for I won trial, the case, though. first Sunday <laughs> here, and you're going to give some lecture and jurisprudence <laughs> to the judge. I think you ought to think second thoughts. That's about what's fun. Uh, this thing now, this did make it easy to vote. Absolutely, categorically not. You got to make it next to impossible to vote. Make it hard to vote. And then you get good voters and you don't get idiots. I'm serious about this. It used to be the political parties, if they could deliver the voters, they would win the elections. This thing about making it so easy that any Jamok can vote, I don't think you're enhancing the democracy by doing that. This is a very serious business. And if you can't take the time and effort to go out there and vote, and I've never missed voting, except once when I was called out of town on an emergency, and they didn't have, they couldn't get it. And I remember that. This is a serious activity. And you're making it, you're watering it down so that any Jamoke is the uninformed electorate. You're no defeating idiot. the purpose. No idiot. You gotta have an informed electorate. That's yeah. like, did you listen to my lecture where I said 10 to 20 percent of the people are about the only ones who know what they're doing when they vote? And you want to make it expand that. No. Yeah, hi, yeah. Very bad. Now the other thing, and you got a guy here from and members of uh, the Jane Adder Senior Caucus, and you want to get rid of this red light stuff. Well, we're pedestrians and senior citizens, <laughs> and we got to make it through those intersections. Mm -hmm. And guess Run what? Quicker. You cannot survive an automobile mm -hmm. if you're hit by an automobile over five miles per hour. It is a fatal accident. Mm -hmm. You are dead. Yes. And you are, and what about oh, the more the millennials are not having cars? And then they're just like me, joining the community of pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And he didn't talk anything about enhancing our public safety to get across that street. That's right. You don't care about us. And you want it for cars so they can plow. Oh, and you, so, oh, I studied this. Didn't you study how many people are hit by cars, Mel, <laughs> while you were doing your research, Mike? 5,000 years Yeah, a lot. All right, we got over that. Anyhow, um, 
Give Charlie a beer. Trades ain't beer. nothing, got nothing to do. They can stop all they want, and it ain't going to really affect the schedule. Believe you me, on Amtrak, if you can find the stop and you can get off the train, and you can be the first person off the train, light a cigarette, you're not going to be able to finish it. They don't spend a lot of time in stations. It doesn't really fill, fill up the schedule. Uh, you know, so that's what I mean. They get clicking. And they even have some, if they don't see anybody's in that station, they do a rolling stop. All right, I guess that's about it. Anyhow, good luck in the election there. Uh, you know, that's it. All right. Hail the bird. Okay. Um, all right. Well, this was uh, this is a real interesting, interesting program tonight, as as usual. Uh, but however, uh, I would have to take issue with um, uh, one of the things that our speaker said uh, is uh, is that uh, when when he was asked by Tim how you would deal with with the obstructionists in Congress and a lot of which. Uh, these days seems to be coming from the, from the Republicans, and our speaker started talking about how well he how, about how well he gets along with his wife. Well, that's not really an answer to the question. Did I mention how beautiful? Uh, well, uh, look, uh, one fool at a time. Okay, you can you can respond you can respond when you get your chance at the end. Now, the idea that the way to the idea that the way to now right now the Republican Party in its current form basically uh, practices obstruction and blackmail. Do as we say or else or else we, we shut down the government. Uh, or or uh, give us what we want or else we won't pass any legislation. That kind of thing. Now the idea and the idea that the way to get along with the Republicans is to get along with them is just nuts because you know they're playing it. That's they're playing a completely different game. That's like that's like saying that the way to get along with a mugger is to be nice to him. You know. Okay. Well then, then just give him give him your money. You know. Um, so basically, that that's a recipe for the Democrats being defeated by the Republicans. Now, uh, if, the, if the Democrats actually want to, you know, stick up for anything, they're going to have to fight the Republicans. There isn't going to be any getting along. Uh, now. Now, Tim, I would like to, oh, Tim's gone. I would like to believe that thorium would work, uh, according to the people I've talked to. Uh, it won't, uh, a thorium plant, if started now, wouldn't be workable for at least 20 years. Uh, no working thorium plant has ever been built. Um, they, uh, if, if it were built, it would uh, be similar to conventional nuclear power plants in certain ways, such as producing radioactive waste. And um, if this was really an economical way to develop nuclear energy, it would have already been done by the power companies. So they've had plenty of time to do it. Now, um, now Bill was claiming that atheists don't believe in charity because because they they, they don't they don't have the fear of God. They, they don't have the fear of God to motivate them. Well, I disagree. There are plenty of uh, I, I am an atheist and uh, and and I help out. Uh, people uh, all the time, as much as I can. There are plenty of religions and philosophical systems that advocate uh, people being nice to each other and helping each other out without using the carrot stick of of of, of an afterlife. Now, now, Joe, uh, you were lamenting um, uh, Trump's apparent loss of freedom of speech because he um, he couldn't get to speak at the uh, at the UIC Pavilion. Now, of course, that was a Kind of a that was kind of a lawless thing, but I just want to say that um, the the pavilion, the, the state of Illinois actually had the option of not letting him speak if they wanted to, because now I'm not I'm not talking about what the what the protesters did here, uh, but freedom of speech doesn't mean that the venue actually has to let you in. They can they can decide who who gets to speak and who doesn't. So I totally agree with with the congressional candidate on that, um, Mike. Your statement that the Muslims hate us is a terrible generalization. I dare say that the Muslims who are giving money to Hillary Clinton obviously don't uh, don't hate her. Um, so like the King of Saudi Arabia, for example. Okay. 
Uh, now, Charlie, uh, you advocate making it harder to vote. I hope I think you should realize that uh, Charlie's not, not Charlie's not here to listen to me. But anyway, Charlie advocates making it harder to vote. I would just like to uh, let Charlie know that the Republican Party as a group would agree with him because making it harder to vote helps the Republicans win. Now, finally, somebody said somebody was oh it was Charlie again was talking about that ever, any pedestrian hit by a car going more than five miles an hour is killed. That's not true. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm against pe uh, people running over pedestrians with their cars, but many people have been hit by cars and have managed to survive. Okay, and that's it. Oh yeah, one other thing I want to say in the time remaining to me. Uh, I think that the, your term hillbillies applied to the residents of Prince William County is highly derogatory. I prefer the term Appalachian America. Don Ritchie, that was fun. Okay, the computer's now officially out of power. I got a backup timer here. All right, brother. Red All right. Billies, though. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> even worse. I, I, I went to your re website, Rob, and I, I saw three things I really enjoyed. Good. You talked about incumbency. Yeah. Or anti-incumbency. You talked about redistricting or gerrymandering. Yeah. You talked about pensions. <laughs> Rob, do you know how many states don't have pensions for their politicians? Do you know? I don't know. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to pass it around, too. One? Ten states. Ten states do not have pensions for their politicians. And three states have done it in the 1990s. So we can do it. We, we should not be laughing about this, uh, this serious issue. Let me pass this around to everybody, please. Take a peek and then pass it around. Take a peek and pass it around. Okay. Very serious issue. It is being done in 10 states. But we're not paying the politicians a, I call it an incumbency penalty tax. You say 10 states. 10 states and three recently in the 1990s. One thing though, Rob, that you didn't mention is Social Security. You're going to Congress, baby. You got, you got the authority to uh, present a bill talk about Social Security. Bernie Sanders has mentioned he wants to lift a cap. Are you aware that there's a cap on Social Security? Yeah, that's right. $118,500. Once you reach that, paying your Social Security tax, you're free. You don't have to pay, a, you can earn a trillion dollars, you don't have to pay tax on anymore for the rest of the year. So I strongly uh, recommend, I'm gonna pass this around too, about Social Security, please. Rob, when you go to Washington, let's lift that cap on Social Security. Lift that ban on Social Security, that cap on Social Security. It's ridiculous that we have a bit. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Here's what it is. Give me one. Here's what it is. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, buddy. Thank you, thank you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's only got one. Yeah, real, real, real quick, Social Security. Everybody in America, actually 95% of Americans, when you work for an employer or yourself, we'll just say an employer, you got to pay 6.25%, 6.2% uh, called the Social Security tax, and your employer matches that, 6.2%. So 12.4% actually goes to the uh, federal oh, government. Pretty good deal. So, so most people are earn less than $118,000, so 95% of us make less than $118,000, so every single one of us are paying, You're paying every single paycheck all year long, but the wealthy folks, and if you have a, if you have a war on the wealthy, I don't, but if you have a war on the wealthy, here's your chance to, to, to get that cap lifted, because if you make over $118,000, let's say you made uh, $120,000 in the first month, well, the second month, and for them, the rest of the year, you do not have to pay that Social Security tax. You see what I'm saying? So if you earn, say I'm a high-powered lawyer, and I made $120,000 in the first month, the rest of the year, I ain't got to pay Social Security tax. I only paid for it in the first month. So that, that's what it comes down to. All right, thanks for your time. Appreciate that, y'all. All right, all right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So you want the mic on, Dave? Hang on. Let me get the mic on. Me? You're going to put me on? Down. Okay, Dave. I take considerable exception to anybody who says that we should make voting requirements tougher for anyone. On the contrary, every citizen has the right and I would argue the obligation to vote. No. Period. No, not the obligation. Yes, and it's one of the privileges of citizenship. And in fact, in Australia, voting is compulsory. You have to vote. And just as we have compulsory jury duty here in the United States. Voting should also be made compulsory. Like Cuba. And, and like Australia. And one fool at a time. I would say simply this with regard to the comments that Charlie made. You've heard me say this before. Sorry, Charlie. Only the best tasting tuna get to the star guest. <laughs> How, how do you know from that? <laughs> Rob, don't, don't answer it. Rob Sherman. All right, final comments by Rob Sherman. Let's thank our speaker again. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight items here. Okay. And they're all brief and to the point. First Hurry. item pertains to what you said to the judge. <laughs> when they ask me if I swear to tell the truth, told truth, not but the truth, so help me God, I tell them no. <laughs> and they look, he said, what did you say? I said, no, there is no God. God is make believe. But I do affirm that I'll tell the truth, told truth, not but the truth. <laughs> Period. Yeah. Okay, Quaker. So that's how I respond. I tell off, it's, it's not the judge that's asking me, it's, it's the, the clerk or bailiff, whatever, wh whoever it is. I let them know the answer is no. So that's the first item. The second item is for Charlie. Charlie, when you go through a signalized intersection, you don't want to get run over. When that red light starts flashing, it says, don't walk, don't walk, don't walk. You know what that means? It means run, Charlie. That's the run light. Don't walk. All right. I don't run Next, oh, that's bad. next, next item. Uh, comments were made. Well, you know, you're running for Congress. You haven't talked about global warming and foreign policy and all that kind of stuff. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what my hallmark over the years, those 30 years, 35 years, as a professional social justice activist, my hallmark is I take on the issues that nobody else is taking on. So the issues I presented tonight, those are issues that other members of Congress have not been taking a stand on, have not even thought about or considered. Those other issues, foreign policy, energy policy, global warming, those sorts of things, those are going to come up anyway. So I don't have to raise those special. We'll deal with that. But these are other issues, new issues, issues specifically geared at uh, the constituency in the 5th Congressional District. Uh, uh, next uh, question was, you know, how do I get along uh, with people? You know, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I'll be able to bring people together. Well, I am the master of persuasion, and I will be able to talk to people and calm them down and get them to cooperate and work together. Celeste and I have worked together for over 42 years, and uh, uh, let's ask Celeste. <laughs> All right, Celeste. Let's ask Celeste. Are, are, Celeste, are you in favor of me going to Washington two years so you have some freedom? Sure. Yeah. Okay. See, I can cooperate with Celeste, and I can cooperate with anybody. Oh, sorry. Next issue <laughs> uh, uh, pertaining to redistricting. Uh, I would spot. It's in my agenda. I would sponsor legislation to mandate compact mm -hmm. districts, so you don't have districts that are strung out all over the place and that cut out an opponent. Use the county lines. That's it. Well, yeah. th that's one way, but the districts that we have now are artificial and, and they're drawn specifically to, for political purposes uh, rather than for the convenience yeah. of the voters. Yeah. So I would mandate, I would sponsor legislation to mandate uh, compact districts and also term limits. <coughs> there are enough people in this country capable of being legislators and executives. We ought to have term limits. You serve for four years or six years or eight years or ten years, 
I haven't picked the number. I didn't, you know, maybe eight years is the right thing. So you have some people with experience in there, but eight years is enough. We ought, we ought to make term limits eight years, maybe eight years for Congress, two terms uh, as a senator, and that's it. Cut it off. So uh, I'm in favor of term limits. I'm also in favor of eliminating winter elections. There's no reason why we can't have elections between the middle of May and the middle of November. There's a reason why the uh, primary in Illinois is in the middle of the March. Of middle of March, it's so that uh, opponents cannot get out and meet with people outside in January and February. They don't want opponents to have an opportunity to gain gain name recognition and present their agenda. So I would ban elections during winter, and they also want to make sure that, that the weather is miserable when you have to circulate nominating petitions. <laughs> All right, we're down to my last issue. Are you sitting down? Charlie, my last issue, you're going to love this one. Last issue. I propose we eliminate the fare box from the Chicago Transit Authority. Make bus and uh, rail transportation on the CTA and also PACE free. Yeah. Now I studied, I have studied their, their figures. CTA takes, uh, takes in about $600 million at the fare box and PACE takes in about $75 million at the fare box. We eliminate that, have that cost covered by Congress. We'll start with, you know, since I'd be representing the Chicago area, we'll start here, experimental policy, uh, you know, a, a uh, what, what do they call it? It starts with the P, a, a, a prototype, or uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, uh, <coughs> proposal? No, it's not proposal, but the, Pilot project. It, it, it's, it's an introductory project, uh, experimental, pro demonstration, that's what it's called. Demonstration, demonstration project, starts with P, right? Demonstration. <laughs> demonstration project, and if we eliminate fares here, you know, somebody mentioned about all the money we spend on foreign policy, giving away money to foreign governments. Let's give that money to the CTA and PACE. You know, the, the rich people in the suburbs, they can afford for their rides on Metro. Oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> a human but right. Let's start that as a demonstration project and see if we can get lots and lots of more people uh, uh, transportation. Uh, maybe even we can uh, eliminate uh, the fares for riding on coach on Amtrak, get a lot more trains going. You want to ride from Chicago to New York, coach class, you know, if, if you're in a uh, sleeper car, okay, you got to pay for that. But if you're riding coach class, no fare. And that way we can reduce uh, uh, um, global warming, reduce the consumption of fossil fuels, get as many people out of their cars and out of their private airplanes as possible. Uh, it, and uh, by eliminating fares, and let's see if if that will uh, it, it, we want to spend as much money on, on roadways, on ride, uh, on widening the expressways, uh, and then maybe fewer people will be in their own private planes like me. The skies will be uh, have less uh, be less crowded, be safer, be less than me. So those are my proposals. Again, thank you for uh, listening to me tonight. Uh, the, the campaign website is robsherman.com. I'm with the Green Party. Number Get a 41. Green Party. Number 41. Number That's 41. right, number 41. Pull a Green Party ballot. And instead of punching 41 because, you know, I'm anti-violence, you want to oh. you want to touch 41. <laughs> you want to press 41 <laughs> instead of punching 41. It's all on the computer screen. Yeah, I'll put a black marker through my opponent's name on the computer screen. Thank you all for your time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming in early. Come back good. Come back as soon as you can. Glad to see you. They said, someone said on the news we're going to.